Hello and welcome to session three. Today I'm going to introduce you to the identification of moths and the different ways in which we record them. There are 2,500 moth species in the UK. Around 900 of these are macro larger moths, the rest micro smaller moths. Today we're going to focus on the larger moths, the macro moths. Key identification features to look at are the wing shape at rest, abdomen shape, markings and antenna. So it's useful to get to know the terms for the different body parts. Mocro moths are split into 13 families and lots of different subfamilies and characteristics of these are helpful in the identification process. 11 of these families are present in Yorkshire. Swift moths, there's five species in the UK. They have elongated wings that are held almost vertically against the body when at rest and they've got really short antennae and tend to fly at dusk until full darkness. Leopard and goat moths, there's three species in the British Isles but only one that's found in Yorkshire which is the leopard moth. It has six large spots on a big furry thorax and heavy spotting on whitish wings along with males having comb-like antennae. One of my favourite families, these are the clearing moths. So there's 14 species in the UK, two in Yorkshire, and they mimic wasps to protect themselves from predators. So they've got transparent wings and black bodies with yellow or red bands on them, and they fly during the day. Forester and burnet moths, 10 species in Britain and Ireland, four in Yorkshire. They are also day flyers. Key characteristics are round-tipped, narrow forewings, stout antennae that are always pointed forward, and in some cases they're clubbed like those of butterflies. Adults and larvae are toxic to non-insect predators and they release poisons when attacked, apart from foresters which are not. The Drapanidae family is split into two groups, the hook tips and the loot strings. There's six resident hook tips in the British Isles. The seventh is an occasional migrant. The tips of the forewings are strongly hooked except for one species. They are day and night flyers and often caught in light traps. The loot strings, there's nine residents to British Isles and most of them have got a prominent scale tufts or ridges on the thorax. Egger and lappet moths, there's 10 resident species and one occasional migrant. They are thick set, medium sized to large moths with deep rounded, usually warm brown or yellowish wings. Generally bearing a small central spot or two cross lines on the far wings. And males have really broadly feathered antenna, as you can see in the pictures, and can detect scent of unmated females from several hundred metres. The oak egger and the fox moth can be seen during the day. The emperor moth is pretty unmistakable with those large central eye dots on the wings and you can see the larva is really striking too. Hawk moths are possibly the brightest, most striking moth family and include the biggest moths in Britain by wing and body size. There's nine resident species and nine migrant species and they're named hawk moths because of their fast and manoeuvrable flight and their large size. And a number of them have brightly coloured hind wings, which they flash when disturbed to deter predators. Geometridae is one of two large macromoth families with 300 species in the UK. It's therefore split into five subfamilies, the mockers and waves, carpets and pugs, orange underwings, thorns, beauties and umbers, and the emeralds. Most species have broad, rather triangular forewings and slight slender bodies. And this enables low energy flight rather than power and speed. They're easily distinguished from butterflies by their antenna that are often feathery in males and slender in the females, but they're never clubbed like the butterflies. This family includes the prominent kitten and processionary moths. 29 have been recorded in the British Isles. They're furry, thick-bodied moths, in many cases with rather long, tapering forewings that are usually held close to the body when at rest. Some species have prominent projections that are raised over the back when the moth is at rest. And wing markings are quite subtle and cryptic, often in beautifully textured patterns which help them blend with dead leaves and bark. And many species rest with the forelegs outstretched in front of them. 
This is a very diverse group and it's split into 10 subfamilies, but I'll give you a few examples of the more characteristic species and their family features. So the herald have strongly hooked forewings held horizontally when they're at rest. The straw dot, which is a small slender species. The snouts, as the name suggests, have a snout which is composed of long palps. The tussocks, their larvae have characteristic brush-like tufts on their backs and some of the adults rest with their fallow wings outstretched in front of them and the males have strongly feathered antenna. Tigers, ermines and footman moths. So tiger moths are boldly striped and banded. Ermines usually whitish wings with black flecks and spots which is reminiscent of the ermine robes of dignitaries, so that's why it gets its name. And the footman moths have long, narrow forewings, and they rest with them held over their back or wrapped around their body, which resembles long, stiff coats worn by Victorian servants, which is a good way to remember their name. The fan foots have prominent elongated palps. Males have fan-like brushes on the forelegs, which is why they get their name too and the underwings, which in many cases are intricately patterned and have brightly coloured banded hindwings. And they also have, uh, often anyway, they have prominent spines on the legs. This is the largest family of macromoths in the British Isles with about 370 species. Most British notchwids are medium sized, stout bodied, frequently brown moths with four wings that are substantially longer than they are deep and they're most specialised for powerful manoeuvrable flight and fly mainly at night time. The majority of long distance migrants are noctuids and they often have a conspicuous kidney shaped marking and an adjacent oval marking and other marks in the central area of their hind wings. They're separated into many subfamilies uh, but some of the main ones are the silver and golden wise, gems and brasses. So these are usually with metallic patches or letters on their forewings and they have tufts on the top of the thorax and abdomen. Then we have the daggers, which as the name suggests, have dagger-like markings on grey forewings. The sharks, their thorax has a frontal crest or a number of crests, which in some cases resemble a shark's dorsal fin. The straws and clovers, they're robust, often migratory species, and they usually have quite striking markings. The Brocades, Quakers and Wainscots have well-patterned forewings that are held in a shallow tent-like way, with ends that form a kind of V-shape. And then there's the darts, yellow underwings and clays. So these have narrow forewings that are square-ended and held flat over their body, and they deeply overlap, and they're often richly and intricately marked. So we've seen how diverse moths are and had an insight into the many different species that can be found. But why is it important for us to record them? Well, moths play a vital role in telling us about the health of our environment. And a great example of this is the peppered moth. Peppered moths are usually white with black speckles across the wings, which gives it its name. This patterning makes it well camouflaged against lichen covered tree trunks when it's at rest on them during the day. There's also a naturally occurring genetic mutation which causes some moths to have almost black wings and this forms called melanic and they're not so well camouflaged against the lichen as usual peppered forms. So they're more likely to be eaten by birds and other predators. This means that generally there's much fewer black farms which survive to breed. So they're less common in the population than the paler peppered farms. This is the normal situation observed in the countryside of Britain and Ireland. However, in the 19th century, it was noticed that in towns and cities, it was actually the black farm of the moth that was more common than the pale peppered farm. Industrialisation and domestic coal fires had caused sooty air pollution which had killed off lichens and blackened urban tree trunks and walls. So it was now the pale form of the moth that was more obvious to predators, while the melanic form was better camouflaged and more likely to survive and produce offspring. As a result, 
Over successive generations, the black moths came to outnumber the pale farms in our towns and cities. Since moths are short-lived, this evolution by natural selection happened quite quickly. For example, the first black peppered moth was recorded in Manchester in 1848, and by 1895, 98% of peppered moths in the city were black. In the mid-20th century, controls were introduced to reduce air pollution, and as the air quality improved, tree trunks became cleaner and the lichen growth came back. So once again, the normal pale peppered moths were camouflaged and the black farms were more noticeable. Now, the situation in urban areas has again become the same as in the countryside, with pale peppered moths being far more common than the black farms. So natural selection has been seen to work in both directions, always favouring the moth that is best situated to the environmental conditions. Since moths are so widespread, found in many different habitats and very sensitive to changes, they're particularly useful as indicator species. Monitoring their numbers and ranges can give us vital clues to changes in our own environment, such as the effects of new farming practices, pesticides, air pollution and climate change. Simply by noting down your sightings of moths, whether from your kitchen window, back garden moth trap or remote mountaintop, you can make a real contribution to their conservation across the UK and implications on the wider environment. Casual sightings. So any larger macro moths like the ones we've been learning about today. So if you see any of these, whether you're moth trapping, relaxing in your garden or walking on a mountain top, they can be recorded and submitted to form part of the National Moth Recording Scheme. And it involves three simple steps. Step one, spot and identify your moth. Step two, write down the essential details to make a record. So this is usually a minimum of a date, location, which is preferably a good reference because it makes it a lot better, especially when we come to mapping records. And it's just much more specific the species and of course the number that you've seen. And step three is to send the record to the appropriate county moth recorder or use the National Moth Recording Scheme online form or you can use the iRecord app. You can attract moths to your garden and record what you see. So most flowers that attract butterflies also attract moths which come to feed on nectar both at night and by day. So flowers that are particularly attractive to moths include those of buddleia, red valerian, heather, sallow and ivy. And you can try searching flowering plants with a torch for an hour or two after dusk. And overripe fruit can also attract moths. Sugaring. So moths will also come to artificial nectar, which we call sugar. And this is really easy to do. So you can heat about 500 millilitres of brown ale or cola in a large pan and simmer it for five minutes. And then you stir in and dissolve about a kilogram of brown sugar, brown sugar works best. And also a tin of black treacle. It's a big sugary delight. <laughs> and you simmer the mixture for two minutes and then allow it to cool before transferring it into a suitable container for outside. So you can drop a bit of rum in there as well. Um, it is recommended, but it's not essential if you don't want to waste the rum. <laughs> and just before dusk, use a brush uh, to paint the mixture at eye level onto tree trunks or fence posts. And then you check the sugar for moths with a torch during the first two hours of darkness. Another method to sugaring is wine roping. So you can use a thick cord or cloth made from absorbent material and heat a bottle of cheap red wine in a pan. Stir in and dissolve a kilogram of sugar and after cooling, soak metre lengths of the cord or twisted cloth in the mixture. And then you can drape these wine ropes over low branches, bushes or fences just before dusk and later check for moths by torchlight. It's well known that moths are attracted to lights at night, though the reason for this remains unclear. There's really simple ways to attract moths with light. So you can try leaving an outside light on after dark and look for moths on lighted windows or lit walls and fences. Low energy bulbs attract moths actually really well and are much better for the environment. So try use low energy bulbs. Hanging a white sheet up 
and shining a bright torch on it can also be effective and it's really fun to do with children and some moths will also settle on window panes if curtains are left open or you can use a moth trap so the best way to see lots of moths is to use specifically designed moth traps a trap running on a muggy night in July or August can catch over a thousand moths and usually up to about a hundred different species as well so you can get a really diverse catch using a moth trap and a moth trap is basically a box with a special lamp inside and something for the moths to perch on or hide in which is usually egg boxes and there's three common kinds the skinner robinson and the heath all with different advantages and disadvantages and varying prices and you can obviously make your own as well you leave the trap running overnight and when you return early in the morning, you hopefully come back to a trap filled with moths hiding in amongst the egg boxes, which makes for really easy viewing or collecting in pots for closer inspection. Some species though are often found on the outside of the trap or on the trees or grass around it, so make sure to check these areas too. Should you decide to put moths into pots to take a closer look for identification, you should avoid touching their wings as it can be easily damaged. To dislodge moths into containers, you can give whatever they're on a sharp tap or gently lift each moth from underneath onto a pencil. Make sure pots are dry and clean and only put one moth in each pot and check that it can move around freely. If moths are really active in the containers, you can put them in a fridge or a cool box for a short amount of time, which just calms them. Moths can be kept for a day or two in a container in the fridge while you identify them. Now, when it comes to releasing the moths, you should do it out of sight of birds in thick or long vegetation, and ideally at dusk, and regularly change your moth release site. One of the sites I regularly trap at has chickens, and they become very wise to where you're trapping and releasing moths. So if you use the same spot, um, this is really important to, to change where you're releasing your moths each time. There's a range of events you can also take part in. So there's Moth Night, which is an annual celebration of moths and moth recording. And it encourages people to record somewhere new, to invite friends or organize a public event. Then there's the Migrant Watch. So this is a simple online survey for anyone who spots the amazing hummingbird hawk moth or beautiful painted lady butterfly. And then there's a the big butterfly camp. So that's a simple online survey of butterflies and day flying moths, which is aimed at people with no previous experience of recording and it's really simple to do. There's lots of projects and surveys you can get involved with across the region. If you'd like to know more, please get in touch or visit the Butterfly Conservation website. You'll also find some helpful resources links on the Yorkshire Dales Millennium Trust website underneath the videos. I hope you've enjoyed these sessions and happy spotting. <laughs>